I felt really good in my spirit about our beginning last night. And, um, you know, sometimes you never know what to, what to call these different series. But I'm calling this one the revelation of who God is. And all tied up in who God is is what we can expect him to do. And uh, the word revelation is very important to us in this conference because we're not teaching about information. We've all got lots of information, but we need revelation. We need to know that we know that we know that we know in such a deep way that no circumstance can ever take it away from us. When you really know that God loves you, then no matter what happens, you never doubt the love of God because it has become a revelation in your life. And um, we started last night in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, where Paul prayed for the church that they would have wisdom and revelation to know God to know God, not to know about God, but to know God. And I don't think that we can even begin to imagine how awesome that is to be able to say, I know God. You know, uh, we, think it's, we think it's something big to be able to say we know some famous person. Or, you know, to say, well, you know, I know the pastor. I had lunch with him or, you know. I know that, you know, I mean, people will see me out somewhere and they're just like, I mean, I saw a lady yesterday in TJ Maxx when I was trying to buy a purse because, as I said last night, my shoes and purses didn't get here. So these were the only ones I had. I wore them and I kind of like them, so I just thought I'd wear them today. And, uh, you know, people think I live in that box, you know, that little TV thing. And uh, so when they see me other places, they're like, <laughs> it's really pretty hysterical. It's like, and so she said, you look like that lady on TV. <laughs> I, I get that. It's funny. And I can tell it's coming before anybody ever says anything because they look at me like. <laughs> so I just said, yep, that, that's me. Oh. <laughs> and then she says, I cannot wait to tell my sister. She will not believe that I saw you. Okay, so my point is, is if she can get that excited <laughs> over just seeing me, how excited should we get about knowing God? So Paul said, I want you to have revelation about knowing God. And he said, further, I want you to have revelation about the hope of your calling, we want to make hope a habit in our lives. Everybody say, I'm addicted to hope. I'm addicted to hope. And he said, I want you to know the hope of your calling and the inheritance that is yours in Christ, which means, Paul said, you need revelation about what is yours in Christ. What is yours? Not what you're trying to get, but what is yours yours and then lastly he said and I want you to have revelation about the power that is in and for us who believe and it's the same power by the way that raised Christ from the dead and if that power that raised him the dead dwells in us the Bible says it should quicken our mortal bodies that means like ooh, Wow, energy, I feel good. Quicken our mortal bodies. And so we're going to go on this morning talking a little more specifically about some of what is ours in Christ. And, of course, I'd have to stay here a year to get through all of it, and then I probably would only scratch the surface. But you're going to get the idea. Now, how can we know God? It's fine for me to stand here and sound spiritual and say, we know God. But how can we know God? Well, number one, we can know him through his word. You have to know the word of God. If you are not going to study, 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 study the word of God, you can forget knowing God. You can't know God in the way that we're talking about just because you know somebody that knows God. Get old, don't be satisfied with secondhand faith. Have your own walk with God. 
We can know God through his promises, and we need to take every promise personally. We need to know what God expects of us, and there are some things that he expects of us. And number one, first and foremost, he expects us to believe. Not believe and then doubt, and then believe a little, then doubt, 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 and then believe a little, but to believe. John eleven forty 40 says, only believe and you will see the glory of God. So no matter what you're going through, your job is not to fix it, it's to believe. Just believe that God is working no matter what you feel like, no matter what you see. If you have prayed and trusted God and you have found a promise in the word that says that God will take care of it, then you, your position now is to believe. Amen. Amen. It may feel like nothing's happening, but I can assure you that something is happening. And then we also need to know, and I want you to pay particular attention to this because this is kind of the theme of what we want to talk about today. We also need to, to know, and a part of knowing God is we need to know what to expect out of Him. You know, Dave and I marvel because we are now married 43 years, and we are <laughs> pressing toward 44, is that right? And um, we just, we know what to expect out of each other. I mean, I can tell you before he does it what he's going to do in a given situation. And he can tell you the same thing about me. Well, we need to know that about God. We need to know his character. And we need to know what to expect. I want to talk to you this morning about your expectations. Now, I think that we expect God to forgive our sins. Most of us who have any knowledge at all of what it means to be a Christian, we hopefully, prayerfully kind of have that one down, that we expect God to forgive our sins. But sometimes I think it stops there. What else are you expecting to do? What are you expecting God to do for you on a daily basis? Or are you just passive and just kind of like, well, I don't know, just kind of wait and see. I have learned over the years to have expectations every single day of my life. And I verbalize those expectations. That's part of my prayer time. People say, well, you know, when I spend time with God, I don't know what to do. Well, one of the things you need to do is tell God what you're expecting. And it's not like in a sarcastic, like I'm demanding this. It's like saying, God, this is what you have said that you will do. And I am expecting you to do it because I know that you are a person of your word. And that honors God. So you say, I am expecting you to give me favor everywhere that I go today because I am your child. You don't. Drive to work thinking, well, I'm expected to be treated like a dog today because that's the way they treat me all the time. You know, I'm just like the bottom of the barrel here. And even if that's been your experience in the past, you can turn it around. You can turn it around. You don't have to wait for somebody else to come along and make you happy. You can turn it around by getting into agreement with God and out of agreement with the devil. So what are you expecting from God? I want us to look at two scriptures, Psalm 26, 1. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have expectantly trusted in, leaned on, and relied on the Lord without wavering, and I shall not slide. David said, I've done my best to do the right thing. Now I am expecting you to move in my life. <laughs> And I love this one. Let's look at Psalm 27, 13, and 14. What, what would have become of me <laughs> had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. <laughs> be brave and of a good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. Now, we see the word in the Bible, wait on God, and the word wait literally means to expect. If you study that word in the Greek, it means to, to long for, to look for, expectantly. You're expecting. 
expecting God to show up at any minute. You're expecting your breakthrough today. You're expecting your unsaved loved ones to hear the right word and come home and tell you, I've received Christ. You're expecting your physical healing. You're expecting to get that job that you need. You're not just passively just waiting on God. That is not waiting on God. That is some pitiful, pathetic giving up. Waiting on God gives you hope. And it gives you expectancy. And God says, when you put your hope in me, you will never be disappointed or put to shame. Come on now. Who is God? <laughs> I mean, Moses said, okay, you expect me to go in there and tell Pharaoh that this God sent me and that he's supposed to let your people go. Now, just who shall I say that you are? <laughs> what is your name? Let's look at Exodus 3, 13 and 14. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And I love this. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, You shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. <laughs> now, there's a whole lot of great things about the I am, but one of the things it means is he is ever present. So we need to think more about the everywhereness of God. <laughs> that he's omnipresent everywhere, all the time at the same time. Is that not cool? God is with me and with you at the same time, and we can be on two different sides of the planet. So he's everywhere all the time at the same time. He's all knowing there's nothing about your life that surprises God. He's never like not ready or like, oh no, I wasn't expecting that. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> you don't even surprise God. Your foolishness doesn't surprise God. Your hangups, your failures don't surprise God. He knew about them before you ever did them. God knows everything from the beginning to the end. And he is all powerful. There's nothing that is impossible to God. So when the disciples were in the boat and the storm came up and they started getting all excited, Jesus just said, why are you so fearful and timid? He did not tell them what he was going to do. He told them who he was. He said, I am. He doesn't want to tell us what he's going to do. He didn't tell the disciples what he was going to do. He just simply said, you don't need to worry about it because I'm here. And so when we realize that God is here, then we can be peaceful because we know that if our trust is in him, whatever needs to be done, he is going to do it. I am that I am. God's character is wrapped up in his name. The first name that God gave Moses was a name that couldn't even be pronounced. He said, I am yeah. That's the best I can get out of it. And that's probably pathetic, but he said, I am YHWH, which is unpronounceable because it has no vowels in it. Couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't even say what God was. <laughs> God is so far above us that we can't even say what he is. We just know that he's wonderful, that he's amazing, that his power is unlimited, unmeasurable, and we can know him and get this, he wants to come and live in you. I mean, how can we sit around discouraged and full of self-pity and, you know why? Because we meditate on the wrong thing. We get too caught up in what we can see and what we feel and what other people say and we think too much about our problems and we don't think about God enough. And then, you know, we think, well, the answer is to just live in church all the time and just <laughs> a 
live in meetings and, you know, become a meeting junkie and, you know, because we feel good there. But the point is, is to get strong enough, now listen to me, on your own, between you and God, that you can stay happy all the time. All right. They added some vowels to his name and it became Yahweh. Then it became Yehovah. Then Jehovah. Which meant Lord God. And then they took it even further and began to add other names to his name. Like Jehovah Rapha, which is what we're going to talk about today, which means the Lord, my healer. God's name is so important that one of the Ten Commandments is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And I have to take just a moment to tell you that taking the Lord's name in vain is not merely saying God and sticking a cuss word on it. Matter of fact, that's probably the least way that people take the Lord's name in vain. It means to use his name uselessly or frivolously. And one of the ways that people do it all the time and don't even realize it is just by simply saying, oh my God. And it's interesting, people on television, all these people on television, many who claim to not even believe in God, every time something happens, they're like, well, my God. Isn't that a stupid thing? My God, like you already said, you don't want anything to do with God. Now, my God, because you have a problem. And they don't mean any, they, they, it means nothing to them. It's just become a phrase. And so, not trying to make more out of this than what it is, but I think that it is more than what we think it is. And I just want to encourage you to realize that there's power in that name. Now, all of these Jehovah slash names, all are wrapped up in the name Jesus. I don't, we, don't, we don't even really have to know them all today except for education because we have the name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee has to bow. His name represents everything that God is. Jesus. Amen. So we certainly never want to use that name frivolously or foolishly. But my intention is today to take some time and talk to you about something that that I rarely ever do a whole teaching on anymore, but I, I really feel that it's needed. And that is just Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Now, 3 John 2 said, Beloved, I would above all else, above all else, that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, we know that our spirit is much more important than anything physical. So... The first and most important thing that we need to do is mature spiritually. We need to be men and women of God, not just stay like little childish brats all of our life. We need to grow up in God. But that being taken care of, then God wants to load on the outer fruit. And what, two of the things he wants you to have is have your needs met, be prosperous, not only have your needs met, but have enough and an overflow to be able to bless other people. And I'll just put it as simply as I know how to. God wants us to feel good. I mean, are we that shocked about that? Well, if he wants me to feel good, why do I feel so lousy? Well, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Exodus 15, 23. You know, I don't need all that. Let's look at verse 26. <laughs> I must have got carried away. <laughs> Saying, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, you can sit here and listen until your sweet little bottom is flat. But if you don't go out and do what you hear, it is not going to do you any good, nor will it change anything in your life. <laughs> and I actually... Every time you come through the church doors, you need to set your mind. I'm going to go in there today and I'm going to learn something. And whatever I learn, I'm going to apply it to my life. Yeah. 
So if you diligently hearken to the voice of God and you do what is right in his sight, and if you will listen to and obey his commandments and keep his statutes, then he says, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Okay, so let's all understand one thing right now. Jesus is our physician. I thank God for doctors and I thank God for medicine. Most of us would probably be dead by now without it. But we are making a huge mistake if we bypass God. I believe that God gave medical knowledge. And I believe that God gives these wonderful surgeons who can do the intricate things that they can do. I believe it's God working through their hands. Now, you are much more likely to have the doctor help you and have the medicine help you if you go to God first and you say to him, I know they can't help me if you don't help them. Matter of fact, they could give me something that would kill me if you don't help them. So no matter what, how many doctors you're going to, no matter how much of anything else you do, I want to bring you back this morning to the foundation, I am the Lord that heals you. God is your physician. The Word of God is your medicine. Healing is for your whole, your whole being, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, financially, socially. Proverbs 4.20, my son, attend to my words. Consent and submit to my sayings. Let them not depart from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart. For they are life to those who find them healing and health to all their flesh. Well. So the word of God is like medicine. And one translation says that. The word is medicine. So obviously one of the things you want to do. Especially if you need healing. Or if you would like to take it a step further and walk in divine health. How many of you would like to get an upper hand on this and not just have to get healed, but you'd like to just walk in divine health and stay healthy? All right? We need to be on the offensive, not just on the defensive. We don't want to just get a problem, try to resist it. Get another problem, try to resist it. We want to be more on the offensive where we're doing what needs to be done ahead of time to make sure that we're strong in an area. So you need to learn different scriptures about healing and the goodness of God and how God wants to meet your needs. And you need to learn how to meditate on those and think on purpose about those things. Meditation means to mutter under and under your breath. So you might get up and say, God, you're my healer. By your stripes, I'm healed. I thank you that your word is my medicine. And the more I meditate on your word, the better I feel. You're my energy, your strength is in me, your life is in me, and every day I get better and better in every way, and I believe the healing power of God is working in me right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we might need to go to the doctor and we might need to take medicine, but more important than anything, we need to trust God and expect his healing power in our lives. Jesus is our healer, and we need to be confident in that, that he wants to meet all of our needs. om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan en om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen.
Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen... die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen... Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long. Come so far upon this road, and we've seen mountain high, valley low. We will battle on. die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? door de nacht. Eet je slank. Zo kun jij ook jouw droomfiguur krijgen. Geen zin meer in deze loze belofte. Hoe je tevreden kunt zijn met jezelf en je tegelijkertijd weer goed kan voelen, vertelt Joyce Meyer in haar boek Lekker in je vel. Bestel het boek Lekker in je vel nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. 
nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joy-maier.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.